You ready to go? All right. It looks like it's 2.15. All right. We're starting on time. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to this session from Open to Governed, um, where we're going to talk about the relationship between OpenStreetMap and authoritative, with quotes, data, because um, there's lots of ways to interpret that. Um, this is, as we just said, is going to be an interactive discussion. Um, so feel free to come up. We have four awesome panelists that we're going to go to first, but then I really hope to um, to throw it out to the audience. It'll be there's a series of questions. If you go to the Whova app, is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> um, there's a series of questions for this session that are posed as polls, um, and those are the questions that we're going to be going through today. Um, so you can prime your brain by looking at those, and I also encourage you to respond within the app. I'm, I can't guarantee that I can look at it during the session and bring up anything, but um, there's certainly great data points to have for later. Um, my name is Elizabeth Saul. I'm a sole proprietor consultant in Seattle. Um, I work for lots of different public agencies, one of which is the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, um, who is sitting on this panel. Um, and we organized this session to answer a lot of our questions. Um, so hopefully you guys will have all the perfect answers to our questions. Um, but really, the, I think the thing I've learned the most in the past few days is that nobody has all the answers and we're all beginners, if not in, at OpenStreetMap, we're beginners in whatever other section or the next step in OpenStreetMap is. And so um, don't feel free, feel free to uh, let your beginner's mind show here and ask, ask away all the questions because I don't think there's there's, there's not a lot of certainty in a lot of these things. Otherwise, we'd all have it figured out. So um, as I said, we're here for a discussion about OSM and authoritative data. Do they work together? Could they be the same? Um, and we have four panelists who've agreed to uh, for us to put a spotlight on them and their problems. So I'm going to have them uh, each introduce themselves and give us a quick overview of maybe some of the problems or issues they're facing at the intersection of OSM and authoritative data. So, Aaron, you have the microphone, so why don't we start there? All right, hey everybody, my name's Aaron Lush. I am with the North Carolina Department of IT for Transportation, so I solely support the Department of Transportation. And everything, well actually first let me say that uh, I manage a bunch of people, let, a bunch of people, <laughs> Uh, who maintain our authoritative road center line and also a routable network. Um, so everything that we do is based off of our business processes within Department of Transportation needs and the multiple use cases that go with all those business processes. So out of those use cases, we get a ton of requirements and then we have to um, come up with the schema that matches uh, state and federal reporting requirements, as well as figure out a way to model the geometry and all the attribution that goes along with it for our business purposes. So then when we look at things like OpenStreetMap, it's all modeled differently. Not to say they couldn't be the same thing in the future, that's why I'm here to learn more, see where we could take this. Um, but I know that everything that we do, <laughs> our data is not as current as some of the roads in OpenStreetMap. But I also know that some of the legacy, I'm, I'm gonna use that word, I don't know if that's the right word, but legacy data for roads in like rural areas in my state is, is not as good as our data. And so um, if we could have like a combination of the two, that would be great. <laughs> but that's kind of where we are is um, we also have new report, reporting requirements coming for safety analysis. So we need to get things like sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, things at intersections. Um, things that are already in OpenStreetMap, so why should we collect it? If it's already there, could we use it? And that's kind of where we are. Thank you. Greg? Yeah, sure. Uh, Greg Bunce from the uh, state of Utah here. I work at the GIS shop, the UGRC, the Utah Geospatial Resource Center. I am a data coordinator there. Uh, I primarily work with road center lines, trails, uh, transportation-like data. Our office also, um, it uh, falls under our office to maintain the municipal and administrative boundaries. So these are um, annexation, city annexations that come into our office. We validate them. We also have the surveyor within our office. So we're looking at the county boundaries and then uh, we aggregate address points and parcels. So a decent amount of authoritative layers there. Um, for me, OpenStreetMap, uh, the light bulb is starting to turn on over the past couple of years. 
and we're making slow progress, right? Because we're, we're supporting 911 systems, election systems, we're supporting a, a variety of systems, but, but how do we, for me, the light bulb is like, wow, there's so much going on in OpenStreetMap, there's a lot of data there too. Sometimes our, th that data is ahead of ours, sometimes our data is ahead of that data. Um, as I alluded to this morning, you know, there's certain data sets that I would love to see come out of our, our realm, such as trails, trailheads, and I know trails is a big conversation here today, um, and then trailheads, um, uh, commonplace points. I'd love to see them come out of our realm. The, the challenge for us is how do we integrate that or get move that over into OpenStreetMap? Um, you know, there's applications such as Map Roulette, which we're using, but uh, I was talking to Deanne with at, at Esri about how to maybe get trails over. Um, these are polyline data sets. So how do we get more of our data over into OpenStreetMap and then it becomes like a two-way system where we can pull back from there as well. And I think there's some, there's some ways to do that and I think you guys probably have a lot more answers than I do, so. Thanks, Greg. Ms. R? Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nisar Ahmed. I work for uh, the MPO in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, called Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And within that agency, um, the group I, that I work uh, in is the called the Traveler Information Group. So our job is to provide data and uh, applications to uh, public uh, and um, public-facing applications, uh, researchers, and whoever needs uh, traveler-related data. So we have a lot of transit data, we have a lot of traffic data in our system. Um, and most recently, we have um, started a project we are right now calling um, Regional Mapping Data Services. Um, and the purpose of that project is to use OpenStreetMap to deliver um, needs, mapping needs of local agencies and regional agencies in the Bay Area. So for example, transit agencies, they, they can produce uh, standardized maps to the customers. Uh, cities and counties can maintain and uh, map uh, information for their um, residents. And so what the challenge is that we are trying to uh, find or questions that we're trying to find answers to. So for example, cities and counties, they have certain data that they don't, w they don't want anybody else messing with it or trying to uh, you know, edit that da data. So for example, if they have um, uh, signal locations and they want to maintain signal locations and they want to use our um, platform to maintain that data, they don't want that data to be, um, to be edited or overridden by somebody else. So how do we accomplish that um, so that OpenStreetMap is there to support their activities but at the same time uh, they have their authoritative data that they want to maintain themselves. Um, so that's, that's our challenge, that's what we are working with and we're trying to figure out how that's gonna get done. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, Nassar. So we have a lot of, how do we get back and forth between uh, authoritative data and OSM uh, more easily and then a lot of combinations of data of varying uh, security levels, uh, so to speak. Um, Daryl, do you want to do you want to give us your perspective and introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Daryl Dudley, transportation theme of the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Uh, my job there is to optimize 15 transportation layers, uh, optimize their value uh, for you guys, for the citizens of the United States. Uh, I also sit on the UNGGIM, the Global Geospatial Information Management Committee. For that committee, I, work, I sit on the policy and legal frameworks working group. We uh, published a paper on authoritative data. It's really good, you should read it. Um, some of the, you talked about uh, what's my involvement with OSM. I wanna kind of broaden that and consider OSM one of many sources of geospatial information. And if you think ahead 30, 50 years in the future when all the vehicles are automated and connected, um, they all essentially become sensors for geospatial information. 
So the challenge there is how do you take tens of thousands, 100,000 information sources, uh, sift through all the same features, figure out which one's best to use, and then share that with the public. And that becomes very challenging. Uh, so that's why I'm here and interested in authoritative data. Thanks, Gerald. Um, Gerald's going to give us a brief sort of introduction to level set on what is authoritative data, but I just want to give you guys um, who just joined us an FYI that, that we do have some polls in the app if you want to answer it, and it's also a preview to questions um, that we're going to be discussing, and we're going to want some of your thoughts on these questions um, as well. And I'll also give uh, people who manage authoritative data um, and didn't hear their needs represented by the panel, I'm going to give you a, a, a moment after uh, Gerald introduces what authoritative data is to maybe share with the, the room what else you guys are thinking about. So go for it, Gerald. Thanks. And this is what authoritative data is to me. <laughs> uh, through my schoolwork, I have done a lot of reading on authoritative data. Uh, so uh, the resources for this work is at the end of these slides. So if you capture that, you'll find all the articles. Um, basically, coming at uh, authoritative as a social, authoritative data as a social construct. So our understanding of this changes over time as circumstances change. Uh, if you think back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the sources of author authoritative data were inherently governmental. Uh, as new data sources have been introduced into the geospatial ecosystem, our concept and understanding of authoritative data has changed. Um, it's risk dependent. Uh, so if you think about risk of using or publishing geospatial spatial information, uh, you know, the, the bad outcomes range from just annoying to actually deadly, right? You could kill somebody with bad geospatial information. So we have to take that, both of those things, that risk spectrum influences how you manage your geospatial information. The more risky it is, the more possible harm you could cause somebody, the more rigid your processes have to be. Um, if your data just might annoy somebody, you know, the, the less rigid your processes have to be. It is context dependent. So depending on your use case and what you're doing, what is authoritative is really up to interpretation by the committee, or not the committee, but the community that's using it. And just wanted to, uh, kind of authoritative types, official's not really an authoritative data type, but I wanted to mention it anyway. So two types of authoritative data, designated and recognized. Uh, designated, designated authoritative data is, uh, you know, a law, a policy, a regulation says that data is authoritative. The misconception here is often that authoritative data that's been designated authoritative is accurate. That's not true. Some data is, is designated as authoritative, but they don't keep up the resources, they don't give the resources to keep that data up to date or accurate. So don't, don't associate designated authoritative data and accuracy. Uh, recognized authoritative data, uh, there's a really good paper on this by Cravens, um, and that's basically a community agrees that this is the data that we're gonna use for this problem. And that's really uh, the fit for purpose. Uh, and that's uh, the concept of authoritative data now is really about fit for purpose. Is that data fit for the purpose for its intended uh, outcome? And then I wanted to differentiate between official data and authoritative data. Uh, so uh, a, a government agency that publishes data that's not authoritative is official. My example for that is the National Bridge Inventory for the US Department of Transportation. Uh, we, that data is aggregated by us from the states. So it is an official data set. But if you wanted to get to the authoritative data, you would have to go to each state to collect that because it's the states keep it up to date and accurate daily in some cases, and we only update it every year. So that, that difference, I think, is sometimes uh, kind of conflated or confused. So Thanks, Daryl. Um, so of the people in the room, I'm wondering who here feels like they manage or help manage or curate authoritative data? Great. Um, and I'm wondering, for th those people that raise their hands, um, what are some of the issues that you're sort of thinking about in your brain or wrestling with um, as it relates to that authoritative data and OpenStreetMap, um, especially if they haven't been represented by the panel so far? Are there any other problems or things that, that come to mind? Raise your hand and I will bring this mic to you. 
Thomas. Um, well, so kind of uh, coming off of what you said, Daryl, about oh, I'm I'm Thomas Craig. I'm a data analyst for the Washington State Department of Transportation Public Transportation Division. Uh, I don't necessarily represent the views of Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, the uh, so it, the risk point is really interesting to me. That I guess the the what I would say is a struggle for me, or something I'm trying to process with regard to authoritative data and other sources is um, executive and leader understanding of um, what data is and how it's created and how the communication between executives and data analysts um, oftentimes um, creates inefficiencies or just poor communications that, that lead to uh, data that we could be publishing, not getting published, or data that could be incorporated into authoritative sources. And also that, like, the risks that, in my experience, our governments tend to see are the, the risk of breaking the law, the list, of, the list of not following the letter, where, like, from my personal perspective, like, the risk of someone dying is much more important than the risk of the letter of the law not being followed. And so, syncing those things up and, and coordinating our values with our laws and understanding the connections between those things, I should stop talking. Uh. Do you mean coordinating our values with the laws or coordinating the laws with our values? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, probably the latter, but. <laughs> um, now that Thomas has spoken, does anybody else want to chime in with the things that they're thinking about or wrestling with? Hi, I'm Todd, I'm a recovering geographer. Um, <laughs> So I guess the question I'm struggling with is in dealing with federal agencies and the culture of federal agencies, you know, we had a panel this morning, the national map, right? How brand influences public personas and public perception, and then also agency identity, right? There's a threat to leveraging external information to that brand. And your thoughts on how we mitigate that or, or overcome that uh, would be greatly appreciated. We're still laying out the problem. Um, does anybody who uses authoritative data um, and also OpenStreetMap want to chime in? They might not own or be responsible for it. Okay. So I guess um, the out I'll talk about the outcomes that I hope we have if we're lucky on this. And again, please come forward because I'm I'm trying not to like stand up and you know overlord over this but have a conversation is sort of where should we go with these problems and what are the um, opportunities to sort of get there? I don't know if we'll get there to that. We might just be discussing problems and thoughts about it. Um, but the first problem I wanted to discuss today uh, with the panel, and Gerald, I guess you have the mic, but anybody can chime in, is why bother investing in authoritative data if OSM is often better? Should we be investing in all of the crosswalk data in North Carolina if it all exists? in OSM, should the taxpayers of North Carolina pay for that? Thoughts, Erin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll throw this tidbit out there. I think my team alone is about a million dollars a year in salary and benefits just to maintain our authoritative center line. Um, should we? I, maybe. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. Honestly, I have, for the last 15 years or so, been working within the counties, within the state governments where I've worked, and also with the Federal Highway Administration to try and get to even a common data model for authoritative data, <laughs> OSM aside, and we haven't been able to do it, and we're still talking about it. Um, and everyone still has their own silo, and I, I don't know if it's possible when I think about it like in my lifetime with what I've been in conversations about. Um, to your question, Todd, I think you know, there's always a people problem and a mindset change needed, and there needs to be more conversation about it and, and more education. Like, as far as I know, there's two State Department of Transportations here. Why not more? Um, I don't even think, you know, they don't know what they don't know. So how can we start bringing them into the conversation? Um, I would love to have a common data model with the, the way OSM allows you to edit and have validations on the entry of a, a commit to a database. 
Um, I would love to have that. Like here, here is something that we can take since we haven't been able to figure it out in the government level. Why can't we just adopt OSM? Uh, and, and maybe we just need to start having more conversations about that. It's a mindset kind of shift. Um, Gerald, if we could get some FHWA people in here, I think that would help. <laughs> but I don't know. There you go. Thanks. Other panelists. I'll share a story. Um, so it was about a year or two ago. So there's an initiative here in, is this on? Can you hear me, everybody? Okay. Um, we have a wilderness here. There's a bike trail that goes along the shoreline here. And there's a couple spot, spots that it goes through wilderness, and you can't bike in wilderness. So the Senator Romney's office reached out to our office and said, hey, we need a map of trails so we can see we could maybe do some land swapping of trails um, so we can make this like, all the way through. We can swap some, some federal government land, some Forest Service land with some wilderness land. So we have this trails data set, and it, it, at first thought was like, why does it have to be trails when we have a spot like this? Is the one data set that I feel like we need more attention on. Why couldn't it be one of our like prime data sets that's used in elections and 911? And we're, but okay, we can do this. But my first thought is, well, why, why are they not going to use commercial? There's these commercial data sets out there. There's all these other data sets that we could use. Why are they coming to us? But it turns out that they have to come to us. We're technically the official steward of this data. This data wasn't the best data. So it got me scrambling a little bit to improve this data that's supposedly the authoritative official data. Um, again, th that's how this particular data set grows in our office. You know, we'll get an inquiry or, or you know, it'll be needed for something. So we'll have to quickly grow it. When you look at the OpenStreetMap community, th that data is already there, and it's it's in, in great shape, and, it, and, uh, and in other places as well, there might be better stewards. But I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting situation where, you know, they they had to come to us because that's that we are the official. It, it, we we were the accountable ones, right? Somebody needed to be accountable, and we were that office to be accountable. We have a question, a comment back here. Hi, I'm Elizabeth McCartney, and I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey and the National Digital Trails Project. Um, and thank you, Daryl, because that our, our trails data set is, according to that definition, an official trails data set rather than authoritative because we pull our, our trail data from other sources, the authoritative sources. Um, <laughs> the, the question about um, why bother in... Um, with OSM or why bother investing in authoritative if OSM is often better. I think part of that could be the often better. And I thought that I also heard somebody say that sometimes in the rural areas, um, they're a little bit concerned that their roads are better. Oh, that was you, okay. Um, and so that could be a concern. So what I, I, I hear that we, we want to do this and we think that it is valid, and OSM is very good and very robust and has a lot of information and a lot of people, a lot of resources, so why do we want to duplicate efforts? I get all of that, but then we're not really, I don't know if we're really voicing some of the fears or addressing some of the fears that are out there, and um, so the rural areas, that was one of them that I've heard, and then also if you are, uh, if you if you are a transportation person for your for your state, are you worried? And you're going to adopt OSM. Are you worried somebody's going to change a road? Um, that's something. So I I could you know I could hear that too. Also another thing that could happen you know we you know we've gone through a lot of work updating some derogatory names. So what if the name changes back because somebody says well well for, well. Maybe they don't know, and other, and maybe because they don't like it, so that kind of thing. So those are, those are some fears. Um, at the USGS, we also have the National Map Corps, which is a VGI project as well. They keep our structures data set updated, and um, there was a lot of fear internally about that group as well. And what we found out is that. You know, we haven't had, we do have like a bad word database, so there's some automated checks. So we do automated checks for some of the things, and I don't know enough, and I apologize about what checks may be in place for OpenStreetMap, but when we're talking about what our fears are, then we would want, for me, I would want the community to come back and say, well, you know, this is how we would 
mitigate this, this or this is a f- or this is a fear, or we don't have we rarely have any malicious additions, that type of thing. Yeah. So we have budgetary realities, but also needing to point a finger at somebody, um, the responsibility or blame. Um, and Nassar, Daryl, do you have anything to add or um I, I, my, I interpreted this question differently is why would OSM make the effort to make their data authoritative? Um, and that is, uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Everything's context dependent, right? Um, so why, why is authoritative data important? It, and the, the basic thing is that it increases the value of the information because you, people trust it. And if people don't trust your data, then you're not gonna use it, right? Um, the geospatial information value chain first thing they talk about is uh, unused data has zero value at all. So if you build more trust in it, people are more likely to use it, it increases uptake, so the, the data you already have is more valuable. Um, so if OSM is considering some kind of effort to make their data recognized as authoritative, that's why you would do that. Um, I mean, I'll follow up on that. Um, but from my experience, w- as I mentioned earlier, that we provide data to openly to uh, anybody who wants data that we uh, we store, and and so w- our data um, utilization uh, within over three year period, it went from like twenty. I think twenty million requests per month to one hundred twenty million requests per month. And so why that happened? We, we haven't done any survey, any analysis of that. Why did that happen? Um, our assumption is that that's because they can trust us. They know that this data is coming from some source where they can go and complain, right? If there is an issue, they can go and email Nisar and say, hey, your data has this problem. And Nisar will right away work on that and fix that issue. So that is why, to me, that trust, as um, he was talking about, that the trust is necessary to some, some data sets that people would use safely and, and, and can depend on, right? So, for example, I, I was in a session earlier um, where we had three different talks on pedestrian data. So if I take an uh, initiative to develop pedestrian data network for the entire Bay Area in OSM, and I do that, let's say I, our agency invested money to do that, and if that data has any issue and if I am the authoritative source for data, that data, then they can come to me and say, your data has this issue, I'll go and fix that right away. But if I don't have a full authority in, ch- uh, in the editing process of that data, then I cannot take that responsibility, right? So if somebody uh, comes and complains about that pedestrian data not being accurate because somebody you know, on a wheelchair got got into some serious problem, then I cannot take responsibility for that data. So I think those are the challenges that we face as a government agency. How do we, um, in my opinion, in using OSM data, OSM is great. First of all, that, that, is, that is clear to me. It's a great data source. But then how do I make that use of that data to ensure that people can trust trust that data set that I'm delivering to to them for their needs. We have, uh I'll, I'll keep it really quick. I think not all data needs to be authoritative, right? I think um, some data inherently is authoritative and needs to be. So when I think of all the data that we serve in our shop, mo- a lot of it doesn't need to be. So like, the municipal boundaries, those need to be authoritative. There's, there's, there's deeds coming in, there's plaques that are built on it. There's the section corners that needs to be authoritative, the assessor parcels. But there's uh, outside of that scope, I think um, 
you know, we can loosen the grip w more than more more importantly than authoritative. It needs to be accurate. That's that's probably what we want on a lot of other data sets. Is that it's accurate. Is there somebody else? Actually, I just had a really quick oh. comment about the often because from what Elizabeth was saying, that often is a problematic word. And going back to what Aaron was saying, that in rural communities things are not always as well mapped. So I want to just bring up that idea of tools, of bringing up algorithms like where can we see where OSM is undermapped or can we build communication structures between this community and there and say, hey, it's a little weird in the rural. Can we like just take this community, go there, go map there and just build those kinds of structures. We're going to do one more uh, comment on this topic and then we're going to move to this one. Uh, I'm uh, Walt Daniels. Uh, I work with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. Uh, we build and maintain trails in the metropolitan area. Uh, and since we're the ones who build them, uh, we know where they are. And uh, the state has, the parks have sort of a database of what they think the trails are, but they're always behind because we, we keep moving things. <laughs> uh, so who's authoritative in this kind of thing? Great questions. I skipped the, the second question because actually I think we discussed it in the first one, but if that's okay with everyone. Um, I sort of also wanted to gather um, some examples of like how do they currently work together or try to work together, um, these different data sets. Um, I know about, uh, and I'm not going to assume that everybody knows about each of these things, so, and I'm not an expert on each of these things. I don't see is anybody who can speak to public domain maps in the audience? I'm going to ask Daryl then. <laughs> um, if you're not familiar with public domain map, um, it is a tool through which uh, we collect geospatial information, volunteer geographic information, uh, separate from the ODBL license that OSM requires. So uh, all the underlying layers and everything that we use to digitize the information uh, is public domain. So we capture the information in the public domain and then we send a copy to uh, the federal agency or some other entity that collected it and then that copy goes to OSM. So uh, we don't have the tension between the public domain license and the OWL license uh, that many public agencies face. Um, so that effort is ongoing. Um, if you want to chat more about it, happy to, to, happy to do that. Um, as far as that and authoritative data, uh, the data collected in our pilot is collected by the community of, of, of um, OSM mappers and then is reviewed by federal GIS credentialed uh, GIS experts. Uh, and that transforms it, that process transforms it from source data into authoritative data. And I would just add the one thing I learned about it last night when talking to Daryl is that it, it essentially becomes a broken fork. The public domain map is not then updated when the community updates OpenStreetMap, as far as I know. Yeah, so one of the challenges we really want is to get, you know, I think everybody's talking about it, right? What's the connection between multiple data sources uh, and the collective geographic features that everybody needs to use or and have access to? especially thinking about transportation and automated vehicles. Um, if a vehicle recognizes that there's a boulder in the road or a bridge is washed out, how is that data collected, uh, verified, and then shared across the fleet so we don't kill anybody, right? Because there's an inherent public good uh, in that space and that public good needs to be recognized and that data needs to be shared so we don't hurt people. Thanks. And then we do know there's a lot of volunteer-led projects to bring authoritative data into OSM, um, not the reverse, of course. And then there's a lot of large effort combined data releases. So, you know, Daylight's been around for a while, the Daylight distribution, and now that's moving to Overture uh, distribution. But I was wondering if anybody in the audience or on the panel had any other, um, other contributions to making sure we all sort of knew about how um, authoritative data and OSM currently symbiotes or not? 
Hi there, uh, Dean Kensaw from Esri. Uh, Greg alluded to it before, but one of the programs we've done for many years, Esri has been getting authoritative data from our user community and putting it into the Esri maps. In the Esri maps we host, there's over 600 million features from authoritative providers. And then a few years ago, we asked them if they would like to share their data beyond Esri to OSM, and about half of our contributors have opted into that. So we've unlocked a lot of that data, and the way we're getting it into OSM is by putting it in, into RAPID. So we transform the data from the authoritative schema into the OSM schema, and then we publish it as ser feature services, and then RAPID can go pull, uh, pull that data, and then editors of OSM can go bring that data in. And last comment on that, kind of to what Elizabeth was saying, one of my, uh, sometimes I'll go curate data that's coming in from authoritative sources and I'll compare it. And basically we're looking to see if the data is going to improve upon what's in OSM. And if you take a layer like buildings, oftentimes you'll see the downtown area is well mapped in OSM, but the rural outside is not well mapped. And I'll generally go look on the outside and see if there's missing data. And where it does is missing, then we'll add it. And then the OSM community can pull that data in as it sees fit. And then we're pushing it into projects like Daylight and Overture. That's a great example. Anybody else have anything to add? Or should we move on to the next question? Um, so should OSM itself reflect levels of verification? And this is an example um, that I pulled from OSM on the depth of the ocean, which actually has a key field or that says, um, you know, source quality, known, doubtful, unreliable, and then it has a maintained, not maintained, not confirmed. This is the only example I could find within OSM that actually had the sort of level of quality um, associated with the data itself. Um, but I'm, I'm curious um, what the panel thinks first and then the audience. Should OSM data reflect any sort of level of verification and should that be necessarily by some sort of authority? And then who is that authority? I think it definitely should. Um, when I think of OpenStreetMap and OpenStreetMap data, sometimes we just think of what's been rendered on a base map, right? But behind the base map and behind the scenes, there's actually a lot of data in there. So when we pull in the, so we'll pull, we pull the open source places from OpenStreetMap, um, we have some validation checks that we're looking for as we bring it in. So we, so much like the daylight distribution, you know, it, it's not a direct representation of the data that is in OpenStreetMap. So if you had, you know, this type of validation stuff, um, that's another check that you can make. So if we're pulling in data or if you want to render data into a, a web map, you'd be able to use features like that. So we would know, okay, well, warning on this one, let's skip that, but bring this stuff in. So I, I think there's huge value in having that. And it, it's okay to have more data, again, in OpenStreetMap that doesn't get rendered. Yeah, I think uh, the, um, to me, the more important question is who's going to be the authority who labels that, right? Um, puts that label on a, on a piece of data. So I would like to hear more about that um, if there is any thoughts and ideas. But def the, to answer your first question, yes, definitely. This is definitely going to be useful, something like this. Uh, I agree, yes. Um, it's, it's a fact. Ponzio wrote a paper in 2004 about um, the process of making data authoritative. Um, it's in the list of references at the end here. Uh, and he proposed a maturity level uh, zero to four, zero being no analysis uh, conducted on the uh, validity of the data. And then the number four level is multiple subject matter expert experts have reviewed the data and have verified that it's accurate. So that, you know, the idea is, exists. Uh, it's been around for a while. Um, I, I think it becomes increasingly important as more and more data sources become available that this process has to be automated, probably through artificial intelligence, uh, so that you can sift through all the data and all the conflicting uh, resources and define and determine which one's appropriate to share. So I, I think the maturity model or something like it that OSM offers it becomes increasingly important uh, the further we get, go further in time, future, the further we get closer to automation. 
I, um, so this um, verification status, that's nice, but then the question becomes like who put that value in there? So it's just basically, isn't that just kicking the can down the road? Like it's nice to have it, but then yeah, the qu that it doesn't answer any fundamental question or solve, solve any fundamental problem, does it? I would be really curious to hear you guys' opinion on that. I think you need multiple reviews, right? You can't just rely on one, one reviewer. You have multiple sources. You have multiple reviews. So uh, my name is Suresh Dalpali. Uh, I run a company called Gaussian Solutions, and we are subcontractors for a project called Transportation Data Equity Initiative uh, that UW, University of Washington is leading. And one of the components of that project is this thing called confidence metrics. And uh, actually, Nisha, the question you asked earlier whether you would have the editing capability, I think TDI handles that. And when you submit a data set, it actually calculates the confidence of the data elements in that and publishes it. Unfortunately, OSM doesn't take those tags, so this is an additional layer on top of it. But that's an example of what we could implement. And we also implement, like if uh, you as a department wants to implement your own confidence metric algorithm, we support that in that system, right? So maybe that's like an example of, this would eliminate the problem of subjectiveness of a person who is mapping. At the same time, gives the confidence on the data elements present in the area. So that's an example. I do just wanna say um, two things. One is that um, one of the OSM principles, I read this yesterday afternoon as I was making this presentation, is that all the data that you put in there should be verifiable reasonably by somebody observing um, something. I mean, I guess whether who can observe the depth, I'm not sure, of the ocean. But, um, and then one of the other things is I do think that anybody can add a tag to OSM. So um, whether or not it's supported by the tooling might be a different issue. But um, let's go to Anne. My message has uh, bounced around quite a bit with all the conversation, and you actually just hit on one of my points. So um, levels of confidence is what I initially thought when I read that question, and it's not necessarily a matter of did an authoritative source or did an authoritative agency review the data. Maybe it's more what was, you know, what's determined to be the, the metric for the um, accuracy of the data, and maybe that's what gets reviewed, and anybody can review it, and maybe it takes multiple reviewers to say, okay, now we have more confidence that the accuracy of this data is to this level, and it's not necessarily about authoritativeness or not. For me specifically, with, with my role with uh, Department of Transportation data, our authoritative data is official data, so we map our road network to official documentation. So the geometric length of our road network, our center lines, matches what's been approved by our Board of Transportation. It's in the construction plans as the official length. So we know what we maintain. And that number is very important so that when we submit to the feds every year to get funding back for highway road maintenance, that number matters. So we couldn't just willy-nilly take a number out of OpenStreetMap. We need to make sure it matches official source data. But like Elizabeth said, I was reading on the OpenStreetMap website, a core value of OpenStreetMap is the favor of personal knowledge and ground truth. Nowhere does it say official documentation. So that, again, goes against our purpose. But I do think some authoritative data fits well with OpenStreetMap. Ours might be a little more challenging. Thanks, Aaron. I've, oh, we have a few more. Oh, Maggie. <laughs> I promise I won't go on too long. I think there's just a fundamental problem with this, this whole thought of authority. Uh, it really creates a hierarchical problem that OpenStreetMap was created to solve in the first place. So going back to, to that is kind of where I sit. Like, just because you have a job title, it shouldn't give you more authority than someone who might live in a place. And that's the problem with a lot of other data sets, is those people get those hats, and those hats make them more important, and they get to create data that's terrible. So that's all. I, um, Daryl, can you share, Daryl shared an interesting concept with me last night that I'm wondering if he could share with the community here. With the Craven's article? Yeah. 
Uh, so Cravens wrote an article about uh, their effort in California to to map resources or something like that. And their premise about authoritative data is that it shouldn't be designated by the government. It should be uh, recognized by the community because that's uh, who really uses the data, right? It's our citizens. Uh, so that differ differentiation between designated authoritative data and recognized authoritative data, uh, definitely there's a place for that, Maggie, and I agree with you. Uh, but Cravens also went on to say that um, it, it kind of goes against scientific principles. There's no peer review process to say that this data is authoritative. Um, so there's definitely that your perspective is, is uh, shared by other people. And it's, it's a really good article. Uh, you should read that one too. Um, I just want to call attention to, I d I've sort of expanded the question and our, our discussion here up on the board, which is because we've been talking about who is an authority and not only who is an authority versus official, but also um, would this apply to a source of data or the importer um, and how could OSN data reflect authoritativeness? Um, and I'll just point to the fact that we do have a source tag that you can add to everything. And to that point, I guess this conversation is just sort of making me think that maybe the question isn't, is this authoritative, but rather by what authority? Like, we all have different authorities. And some people need to procedurally depend on certain authorities, and that makes sense within their process. But that doesn't make that authoritative. Uh, anything that's uh, said to be authoritative is uh, a function of time. Uh, lots of resources degrade over time. And uh, something that was great 10 years ago may not be so great today. We have one here. Hi. I, I, I think that one thing Can that you I. Introduce I yourself? Sorry. Um, oh, hi. I'm Jim McAndrew. I like maps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing that this always reminds me of is the tiger import. That was a official data set. We have a thing in there saying tiger reviewed. Um, I know Martine brought up who's going to fix that. Martine wrote a tool to go through helping people fix um, things in tiger. And you can still find that tiger reviewed no on things that have definitely been reviewed. No one's updating it. And also if I see something that is authoritative, and I know it's changed, like, do I want to make that change or not? Is that going to keep the community from making more changes? And I, I just see this opening a whole can of worms, and a lot of this we've already looked at with Tiger and seen how things work and don't work. So we should look back at that a little bit. So one question I have in terms of... Oh, sorry. Uh, Ian Hollander. So um, I'm curious with the, the, the North Pier and the... Um, sorry. So with the with the road um, tracking, you know, lengths and things like that, is there survey data by an official survey company or the state or whoever it is that says, yes, we can verify that their line, you know, here's the line of traffic and it wraps around, and you can actually go and then use that against OSN data and say, yeah, it matches, or off by like a couple of feet, who cares about that? You know, or whatever, but or we're really off, and then we're going to say we can we can fix that and say this is based on su official survey data that someone signed off on under pr under pain of losing their survey license by the state that this is as correct as you're going to get. Ian, yes. Uh our, s our official source is from survey data. That doesn't necessarily mean that if we were to copy and paste that in, that um, it, as soon as it gets put into our GIS system, it's no longer like survey grade data. It's now GIS for planning purposes data. And as long for us, for us as long as the geometric length equals what the documentation says the length should be, that's what we really care about. Obviously, we want it to look pretty against imagery and, and stuff like that. Um, also in North Carolina, something that we've done is built conflation tools to be able to conflate our attribution onto OpenStreetMap. Um, I don't know where we could take that. I'd like to talk to people about that. 
Um, there's a company called Streetlight. I don't know if anyone's here from Streetlight, but they uh, collect big data and they use OpenStreetMap as their source. And a new requirement from the feds for us this year was to get traffic volumes on all public roads. And so they did that, but then the challenge was how do we get it from OpenStreetMap line work onto our line work? Um, so we have that conflation code, but what else can we do with it? I don't know. System. So the problem is, is it becomes you have the, the survey data. At some point, it still has to be authoritative, otherwise it's worthless. If it just goes to the point and just says, okay, now it's it's data, it's it's in the system being data, and now it's no longer authoritative, then what's the point? At some point, you just have to say they're close in they're, they're what you did. I, I guess, I don't know, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> Can you di distinguish between the purposes of the data? It's like the survey grade data is for building and things like that. And then you ingest it into um, your center lines, yeah. which is for a different purpose. Yeah. And it's kind of like the, the census data, right? Census tiger line data is built for counting people. It's not really a road data set, okay. right? So y o OSM has ingested a data set built for counting people and uses that uses it as a road data set. Thanks, right? Gerald. So that's why you got to get into this fitness or purpose. You have to define the purpose of your data before it can be recognized or defined as authoritative. Yes, and just real quick, I am talking about uh, the experience that I have managing authoritative data maintainers, and they're doing it for business, pur you know, for business purposes. Business they, purposes can change, right? Like we can change that, but we need legislation to change. Um, the human in me understands you, Ian, but the, spar the part speaking on behalf of my agency, that's why we're doing what we're doing. But I understand as a human. <laughs> <laughs> the checking the box. The, the box checking has a lot of rules. I just wanted to say one thing we do have in OSM is we have this source tag. Um, and I just ran a little query uh, pulling some, some of the OSM data from Salt Lake City um, yesterday afternoon and found all these different sources, many of which are Bing, but spelled differently or uh, referenced differently, um, capitalized differently. Sometimes it's in HTML. Um, and Bing sat also. Um, and all the things with stars, except this star should be here, um, are sort of things that could be, quote, authoritative data sources. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is if there was some sort of taxonomy um, for these such that we don't have this sort of namespace, lack of namespace, rather, <laughs> um, uh, issue, um, wouldn't it be nice to know this comes from Bing, this comes from a federal agency, this comes from something else? That's something I've been thinking about. Um, I think, were you saying that there was somebody who had Gerald covered exactly what the person wanted to say. <laughs> Great. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about using the source field, or do, do somebody here use the source field and have experience with it? Uh, hi, I'm Jake. I'm a mapper and OpenStreetMap <laughs> data user. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about uh, what Martin said about uh, source being itself self-reported, so now it's it's uh, citizen science metadata about citizen science data. Uh, and and um, uh, what I think Ian said about Tiger, and uh, started to think about other ways that the OpenStreetMap community has been self-assessing, not really what we think of as like data authority or provenance, but data quality. Because I think if we start to dig into it, we have a lot of tools that we use for this. We like, um, people will mark things as like, fix me, like this mm -hmm. needs resurvey. Or they'll add a note that's like, I'm not sure if this was the right way to tag this. Someone else, please look at it. Or you know, people add source because they think it's useful to someone else down the line to determine how did this get into the map. Um, but I think it's interesting to observe that like, we I think as a community we haven't been thinking about those tools as an attempt to create authority or anything like it. We're thinking about those tools as um, as ways to track the accuracy and the quality of different elements on the map. Um, so my question for the panel is, uh, I imagine that you all have similar problems with your authoritative data sets where you need to internally assess the quality 
of elements within them. Um, what are your workflows like for that? Well, we keep it short because we have two more questions, yeah. two more big things. We have uh, day, we have data quality staff that assess um, spatial accuracy, but also attribute accuracy, and there are geospatial data accuracy standards um, okay. that we are working with. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different data flows for that. Um, I'm going to refer to the next question just for the sake of time. Although I do agree that quality is really what we want. Um, uh, so how? Could authoritative data sets more easily benefit from the coverage benefits of OSM? And what are the current barriers? And I've listed, just to be, listed the copyright uh, up there as one of the potential barriers. And so I'm wondering if the, the panelists could maybe talk about barriers or things that, what's your wish list of ways that OSM could be more easily incorporated and merged with your authoritative data to create a comprehensive data set that you use for your job? something to say. <laughs> feature level metadata and feature level licensing. So I can I can integrate my public domain data with other data sources and not lose control of my data. Tag level licensing? Yeah, I, I, well it's going to become increasingly <laughs> important that each feature be tagged <laughs> or uh, attributed with its source and uh, we have to create traceability. How is a creature? How is a feature created? How is it modified? When was it retired? Uh, and that becomes increasingly important again as we start sifting through all these multiple data sources. Martin. So um, that that sounds like a great idea, but every single feature is a product of a lot of different people's work who all have their different views on. Like you can tick a box when you sign up for OSM. It's like I would love for my data to be in the public domain. It's meaningless because your data that's being edited by somebody else who doesn't want their data to be in the public domain at all. So where do you go from there? But like, it's, it would be really nice to be able to achieve something like that. This yeah. is a wish list at this point, not a um, brainstorming. So any other wish list items um, or an expression of your current barriers to merging those data sets from the audience? Um, have uh, Facebook and Amazon and other large companies that provide services that our executives are purchasing things from in their daily lives say, this package got to you thanks to OpenStreetMap. You know where this business is on your Facebook and you know how to get to your you know, grandchild's birthday party at this business because of OpenStreetMap. And like, Um, I will say that there's an example of several projects that Thomas and I are peripherally involved in and uh, Nassar that actually do pay the organization that manages uh, the GTFS standard a portion of their grants. And so under that principle, maybe we could all do a better job of not just contributing in-kind time, but contributing to the, the backbone. So I'll write check checks to Maggie. Um, so let's flip this. How could OSM more easily benefit from authoritative data? What are the current barriers, um, and I did look at the import catalog projects that have with authoritative data. Um, there's a lot of dead ones. There's a lot of ones, the um, amount of ongoing automated uh, projects to bring authoritative data into OpenStreetMap um, is very small compared to the amount of projects to delete data that was mistakenly or erroneously or misdone an in the import project. So deletion projects are far greater than the the import projects, um, but what are the barriers and how could OSM more easily benefit from it, if that's even a goal? I'll just keep it quick, but the barrier is time for us. Like we have the data, but then we need to put more resources into then getting it into OpenStreetMap. So we're probably one of those numbers on there of a data set that we want to get over into OSM. And in the long run, it will save us time, but it's just the immediate time. So. Yeah, one, one example I can think of is that, uh, yes, we, we would love to contribute to uh, OpenStreetMap and most likely we will be contributing. Um, the challenge that, <coughs> excuse me, well, we, we were running into is that um, we don't have uh, unlimited resources, right? So we have very limited 
quantity of resources and we would like to use that as efficiently as possible. So for example, if I am editing data and I have a whole bunch of edits uh, together and I want to push that data into OSM, I can't do that right now. Uh, it has to be done, as I understand, one feature at a time manually and that's not gonna be possible for me because I don't have that many humans sitting there in my office doing all that work. <laughs> That's right. Um, I think that we're out of time, um, but I do want to, there are several other questions that we had and I would appreciate if you guys want to go onto the Whova app and respond to them in the survey. And then also Maggie has graciously given us one of the birds of a feather sessions, which is gonna be meeting uh, subsequent to this session, um, and so we'd love to continue the discussion. Oh, sorry, it's meeting at four, which is still after this, but, <laughs> um, and we can talk about maybe what the to-do list is, um, because I think that there's a lot of people with uh, similar issues and uh, concerns, and we all want to do something, um, and before we all go back to our desks and get back to our, our jobs, um, it would be nice to discuss and coordinate on that. So thank you to our panelists. I really appreciate you guys being brave and thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, cheers. So yes, we are on coffee break right now until four o'clock. So the coffee break is in the granite ballroom. Um, come back here for more talks or find this birds of a feather um, keep talking about the things that are burning in your mind right now at the coffee break that's what those are for so thanks for the panel enjoy <laughs>